everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Chris Gobler, director of the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. And I'm going to now give a seminar, State of the Center 2021. Um, it was one year ago we began our um, seminar series, doing a once a month uh, seminar, I think first Monday of each month. And uh, I gave the first one and um, well, here we are a year later and it seemed to make sense to give a review of what we've seen and uh, maybe a little preview of where we're going. Um, and I'm happy to do that. So thank you for tuning in. Um, so I'm gonna start by essentially laying the context of just talking about what we all know already, but uh, you know how the water cycle on Long Island and in New York um, is so critical in affecting our lives. And it's easy to forget that, but certainly, you know, the overarching principle of the, uh, how the watershed and all the water entering the watershed uh, plays two critical components in our lives uh, that, again, it's very easy for us to ignore. But, uh, you know, this water is the water we drink. This water is the water that discharges in the surface waters and therefore influences everything going on in those surface waters. And this water is at risk due to all of the activities on land, uh, be it agricultural or uh, wastewater or contaminants. Um, all of them have critical consequences for, again, the water we drink and our surface waters. And on the drinking water front, um, our associate director, Arjun Venkatesan, has uh, put forth this idea of the wastewater drinking water dilemma. Uh, and the idea that we've got a half a million on-site septic systems in Long Island that are discharging into our water that we're drinking um, and that we are unintentionally uh, or actually just by design reusing our wastewater uh, for drinking water and therefore we better be treating it uh, correctly. Uh, and that's of critical importance because even outside of wastewater and we have all sorts of other things that are threatening our water supply, things like 1,4-dioxane that the EPA defines as a probable carcinogen uh, that is at high levels. In fact, the highest level ever measured in drinking water across the nation has been here on Long Island. Um, and beyond 1,4-dioxane, we are also highly worried about PFAS, uh, which has become increasingly prevalent uh, across, uh, well, across Long Island, across the state, across the country, and across the world, uh, and with increasing alarm being raised with regards to its potential to affect human health. And of course, the contaminant I speak most about when it comes to our drinking water and our groundwater um, is nitrogen. And the way in which nitrogen levels in our groundwater continue to rise uh, as our population has grown uh, and the fact that we now know that the biggest source of that nitrogen to our drinking water is indeed wastewater, uh, specifically on-site septic systems uh, for all of Suffolk County and for much of Nassau County as well. And certainly as a marine scientist during recent decades, I've documented how this affects marine life, uh, but there's now concern with regards to how this affects uh, human health as well. And of course, we all know that human health is uh, nitrate has a strong effect on babies and therefore, and specifically through blue baby syndrome, and there's therefore the current EPA standard of 10 milligrams per liter for nitrate in drinking water. Um, but there's increasing concern about other health effects. And those concerns would be most acute in Suffolk County. Uh, this figure here just shows the concentrations of nitrate in the nation's drinking water. You'll note the y-axis there is millions of people. And so, uh, you know, almost two thirds of the US has drinking water with less than one milligram per liter of nitrate in that drinking water. Um, and you can see in Suffolk County on average, our levels are far beyond what is uh, normal. And, um, and we're beginning to worry about that more and more uh, as a center and even within the medical school here at the university because of the uh, continual um, epidemiological studies that have come out that show that even modest levels of nitrate in drinking water have been associated with elevated risks of cancers. Uh, but again, as a marine scientist, I can also tell you much about how 
those high levels of nitrogen as they discharge into surface waters uh, can have dire effects on uh, marine and freshwater ecosystems. And that's evident in this figure here that was uh, based on the observations just last summer uh, and the widespread nature of what we would call dead zones or low oxygen conditions across Long Island and harmful algal blooms, uh, as you can see from Montauk all the way out towards uh, New York City when it comes to all these different water quality impairments. And this was just during uh, 2020. And on the harmful algal bloom front, they're in marine waters, they're in freshwater systems. Uh, several of them make toxins that are a human health or animal health threat. Others are a threat to uh, marine life uh, and fisheries. But there's plenty of good research to show that in most cases, higher levels of nitrogen either intensifies those events um, and or can make them even more toxic because some of the most concerning toxins that these algae make are nitrogen rich compounds. And it's been shown that with more nitrogen, they do make more toxins. And you know, beyond the harmful algal blooms, those dead zones can also result in negative consequences with regards to the survival of uh, fish and other aquatic life. It also is a threat to uh, coastal habitats. And so uh, the same exact uh, week or within a week or so of when uh, Hurricane Sandy hit the New York area and, um, and led to mass flooding. Um, and everyone was wondering why certain communities were hit so bad and others did much better. This study in Nature came out showing that high levels of nitrogen essentially leads to the erosion of salt marshes. And that's shown in both the macroscopic and microscopic here. Um, you can see that uh, calving off of parts of a salt marsh in the upper figure here. Uh, the lower figure here is our CAT scans of the roots of salt marshes and essentially showing that when you have got a salt marsh that's inundated with high levels of nutrients, those roots decay, degrade, and lead to this calving event because the root structure can't support, support the salt marsh. And across Long Island, we've lost many of our salt marshes and, um, and that's shown here with DEC data uh, but in addition uh, to that, we can also look to the flooding in Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and here I'm just showing this could be almost any peninsula on the South Shore, but here's a great illustration of one in West Hampton where you've got a salt marsh that was kept intact on one peninsula and on a twin peninsula, almost identical, that was not the case. And when you look at what the flooding was like during Hurricane Sandy, you can see on the left the entire peninsula all of the homes were flooded with, the, uh, with no salt marshes there for protection. And conversely, the flooding was much less substantial in the region that had the protection of those salt marshes, which again, degrade with high levels of nitrogen. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the motivations for putting this center together. Uh, many years ago, you know, if we can mitigate the nitrogen, we can protect, perhaps recover these habitats and recover these fisheries and improve water quality. That was the premise on which we were founded uh, in 2015. And now, uh, six years later, um, we've grown to being comprised of uh, more than 30 scientists and engineers from four academic departments across Stony Brook University. And, um, and it's been a great period of growth. You can see here is a picture from 2019. Um, and uh, well, not everyone was in that picture, but still we've had a, a lot of um, great recruitment of new scientists and engineers to help advance our mission. Um, and in the last year, in happy news, we've had uh, four PhD candidates become doctors, um, receive their PhD, doing their research uh, exclusively on the uh, objectives of the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology and helping to advance our mission, which is to harness science to end to harness science to engineer clean water for the protection of public health and the environment in New York and beyond. And we work on both wastewater and drinking water. I'm going to start out with our wastewater uh, initiatives, uh, where our goal is 10 20 30, in that we're working to develop on site septic systems that get nitrogen levels down below 10 milligrams per liter, will cost less than $20,000 per home, and have a life expectancy of more than 30 years. And, 
and those systems are meant to address uh, that dilemma I, uh, invoked earlier about uh, wastewater entering drinking water and or affecting surface waters. And you know, this has been a, a big focus in Suffolk County uh, for the past uh, six years or so. But I will point out that beyond Suffolk County, um, Nassau County is in actually a very similar situation on the north shore of Nassau County. So this is uh, on the right uh, is a figure that came out of the Nassau County Subwatershed Study that was um, performed with and for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And the similarities between Nassau County and the North Shore Suffolk County are striking in that um, you know, wastewater, on-site wastewater is the biggest source of nitrogen uh, to groundwater. And therefore, when we think about the number of homes to it uh, that need to be addressed, we need to go beyond Suffolk County and recognize by including Nassau County, we're looking at almost a half a million homes that really are, need to be the focus of septic upgrades. And in Suffolk County, there's been great advances in creating a program to allow for innovative and alternative septic systems that remove nitrogen to a lower level. And at the center, we've been participating in this program uh, primarily to date through the, our nitrogen removing biofilters, uh, which are shown here and meant to be attached onto existing septic systems and are made to be simple. They run with a single pump. Uh, in the state of Florida, it would still be considered a passive septic system. Uh, and that pump working to distribute wastewater over layers of sand and sand mixed with wood chips. Uh, we have three, three iterations of these systems, our unlined NRB, uh, which discharges directly to groundwater. Uh, and then two other systems, our line system, uh, that is lined and then is discharged for final deposition. Uh, that liner helps assure that we have low or no oxygen conditions in the lower level and uh, therefore is more likely to give us greater assurance of the removal of nitrogen. And then finally, our wood chip box system um, that actually separates the sand layer from the wood chip layer. And again, gives us that assurance of an oxygen conditions and the opportunity to actually change out those wood chip boxes. And earlier this year, we published uh, a comprehensive paper on the performance of these systems. The title is quite self-explanatory that these systems can remove between 80 and 90% of the nitrogen from wastewater as well as organic contaminants. Um, here's a figure from that paper, essentially showing the, uh, that regardless of system, we're able to achieve not only the standard that Suffolk County has for their alternative septic systems, which is 19 milligrams per liter. Uh, but we're hitting the bar when it comes to our own goal of 10 milligrams per liter nitrogen. Uh, and this same paper and a companion paper by Dr. Laura Vermon, associated with the center, demonstrates that these systems also are removing the majority or 90% of phosphorus that enters uh, them, as well as the uh, more than 98% of pathogens. And when we compare the performance of our systems to commercially available systems, um, two out of the three systems we've developed uh, are achieving effluent that's cleaner than any other commercially available system in Suffolk County. Uh, and our third is uh, right there with uh, the best performers. Um, so this is important because of course, in the end, we want nitrogen levels to be as low as possible. Uh, to protect human health and to protect coastal ecosystems. And you know, what we're showing here is that our systems are the ones that are the best suited for doing that job. And again, beyond nitrogen, one of the recent PhD graduates from the center, Trisha Clive's data demonstrates that these NRBs are removing um, up to 100% of things we don't want in our drinking water, drugs, pharmaceuticals, personal care products. Um, and even when it's lower than in the high 90s for removal rates, uh, the removal rates are almost in every single case, even better than what you would get out of a sewage treatment plant. Um, and it hasn't been tested, so we can't really compare to the other uh, types of septic systems, but because of the way our system is designed uh, with that sand layer, we've demonstrated that that's where the removal of these compounds is occurring. Um, you don't see that in any of these other systems. So uh, you know, it may well be that this 
removal is unique to NRBs. Uh, and probably one of the most concerning compounds I've already referred to, 1,4-dioxane, again, listed as a probable carcinogen um, by the EPA. We'll talk more about it later. Um, but this is a compound that's very difficult to remove. Uh, I won't go into the details, but, uh, I, well, you'll hear about it later, all of the technology that is needed to remove this compound from drinking water. Um, and there's very little, if any, removal from, say, a sewage treatment plant. Um, but, again, as the title is already self-explanatory, our NRBs can remove 1,4-dioxane. Um, I'll also just mention, a little aside, this study also demonstrated that uh, counter to conventional wisdom, that 1,4-dioxane is simply an uh, industrial pollutant that happens with industrial spills, um, our study showed the more than order of magnitude enrichment in wastewater due to the use of household products. And that's shown here that, you know, in the studies that we looked at, homes always thankfully had low levels of 1,4-dioxane in their drinking water. But when the water's coming out of the homes, because of the use of different household products, personal care products, cleaning products, the levels are significantly higher. But in happy news, our NRBs are bringing the levels of this 1,4-dioxane down significantly, almost 60%. Um, and on average, the effluent is always meeting the new state standard for 1,4-dioxane, one uh, part per billion or one microgram per liter. Um, so these NRBs are not just the best at removing nitrogen, uh, but they're actually getting our drinking water as clean as possible by removing contaminants we do not want in them. And so we're getting close in our most recent uh, bids to install these systems to meeting our goal. And I'll say that this is in the range, $25,000 or so, uh, by which installations of alternative, innovative, alternative, innovative and alternative septic systems uh, in Suffolk County uh, can be covered by grants uh, from the state, from the county, and on the east end by some of the towns. And uh, our NRBs are now in the experimental phase of testing by Suffolk County, which means within a year, we're expecting that these will be provisionally approved and anyone can install an NRB. And we're thinking about what that might look like uh, and ways in which NRBs might be installed and how the role we'll need to take uh, in doing that, in training people to install these systems, uh, to getting them installed in a widespread, um, across, water, across watersheds in a widespread basis, um, and getting this information out to the public, and probably most importantly, identifying installers uh, for these specific systems. So hopefully in a year from now, we'll have more to talk about on that front. But beyond NRBs, we are also working very hard to come up with other septic systems that also will be a solution uh, for addressing wastewater uh, on Long Island and addressing those 500,000 systems that may need to be replaced. Uh, because NRBs are a great solution and are producing, uh, again, the cleanest effluent possible, but they're not always going to be the right solution, particularly for homes that are have smaller lot sizes. Um, and we think we can get even lower on prices with some alternative approaches. Uh, and we're getting there at our wastewater research and innovation facility, located just off campus. Um, it's the only such facility in the Mid-Atlantic region, and the only other facility we're aware of uh, is up in the Northeast. So it's the second facility on the entire East Coast. Uh, for those of you familiar with the general area, this is Stony Brook Road, which would take you up to the university. And so, uh, and this is uh, 347, right? And that's Compton Highway. And uh, this is pump station number 10 uh, that receives uh, wastewater that comes in from re residential communities. We're able to tap into that wastewater and bring that wastewater um, into our facility and into our trailers for experiments. Um, and this effort and having all this happen uh, has been led by our associate director for wastewater initiatives, Frank Russo. Um, he actually began this initiative when he wasn't even working for us. He was working for H2M, um, but that's how we got to know him. And uh, when he was ready to move on, and he was so excited about what was happening here and other things we were doing, we were able to coax him to join our team. And he's really led the charge on making this a fully operational research facility. And you can see here, it's comprised of 
multiple research trailers within which we have wastewater running in various columns that let us perform experiments. Uh, and what we're really excited about is now the backyard area. Um, this is going to be our in the ground test facility uh, with groundbreaking on this area and this being built out starting this summer. Um, and within there, we're going to be installing some of our own systems that I'll be talking about momentarily. And we're purposely leaving some areas open uh, for collaboration. And so for companies that may be interested in having their technologies refined or tested, we've already been in conversation with several companies who have had interest. Uh, and we think that our team of scientists and engineers and our analytical capabilities uh, put us in a position to advance any technology uh, and make it even better performing than it may have already been before we were able to uh, work on it. Uh, but again, beyond NRBs, we are coming up with other solutions that we're excited about. And so the first of which I'll mention is our um, Flex Treat Biofilter. And this is, uh, as you can see, an all-in-one septic treatment system designed by our professional engineer, Frank Russo. Um, this is uh, technology has been patented or is the, is the patent pending within the university. Uh, what you're looking at here is the prototype of the system designed by uh, Long Island construction firm, Roman Stone. Uh, and this exact prototype will be installed this summer. Uh, the Flex Treat Biofilter builds on what we've already done with uh, NRB. So it uses the same general principles, but advances them by firstly shrinking the size and therefore making it simpler and less expensive to install uh, and has another uh, series of uh, features uh, that the NRBs don't have that may allow it to be smaller and to perform optimally, such as pre-aeration, uh, continuous flow, the ability to recycle the flow, and the ability to adjust both the flow rate and the recycle rate. We've been testing this system um, literally now for years uh, at the WERF facility. And here is the first year of testing uh, where we adjusted lots of different things, the flow rate, the amount of nitrogen within the influent. Um, and in a year of testing, we had trouble getting effluent. You can see the, the influent of it was up to 70 uh, milligrams per liter, lower to start with, but even when challenging it, and we had trouble getting effluent that was much above two milligrams per liter this entire, uh, during this entire one year experiment, which advances to the next phase where essentially we purposely were pushing this, uh, this system to the limit and asking the question, what will it take actually to make it not achieve this very, very low rate of uh, effluent? And so we upped the effluent, the influent to over hundred milligrams per liter, um, which if you would have asked us a few years ago, we would have said, well, that's not realistic, but we actually have come to realize that on Long Island and specifically in Suffolk County, uh, the amount of nitrogen wastewater is significantly higher than we had originally anticipated. Uh, more than twice as concentrated. So 100 milligrams per liter is high, but realistic with regards to some of the things that we've seen. Uh, and we've actually upped the uh, loading rate. And can, again, the higher we can get this loading rate, the smaller we can make the system. Um, and we were able to keep it below the 20 milligram per liter uh, rate that was um, uh, the standard that was set by Suffolk County. Uh, but in addition, we, um, uh, with optimizing the flow, we we're also able to get it close to or below our uh, 10 milligram per liter standard that we have internally. Um, and we've also did an experiment to ask, answer the question, when you allow the system to rest, uh, for example, someone goes on vacation or a summer home, does it still function and the answer was yes. So we're excited about this system. Again, we'll be installing it in the ground in the coming uh, weeks. And then the next step will be to start installing this at homes as well and put it through the Suffolk County uh, Article 19 approval process. We're also working on a second on-site system that can be installed that will be in small size, a sequencing batch nitrogen removing biofilter. Uh, and this has been researched by Dr. Shinwei Mao and her lab team. And um, so we're, we're, I'm not going to show too much data on it, but I'll simply show it involves the idea of having different aeration uh, and uh, it's being optimized in the bench scale. It's been shown to 
have effluent that is less than 19 milligrams per liter meeting the county requirement and uh, recent research has optimized the type of media to be used to uh, maximize nitrification and denitrification. Um, and uh, we're expecting the coming year to have some great results out of this system as well. Moving off of the uh, IA systems themselves, I wanna now pivot to talking about something known as polishing units. And so in Suffolk County, after wastewater goes through an IA system, an NRB or otherwise, in most cases, it has to go to a final deposition phase. Uh, so we can go to the original leaching ring or to a drain field. Uh, but Suffolk County is offering uh, incentives for people to send that wastewater to what is known as a polishing unit to get that nitrogen level even lower. And we've been talking to them about ways we can achieve that. Uh, and we've come up with some solutions that we are pretty excited about. Uh, and they build on our successes with regards to the nitrogen removing biofilters. So for example, uh, Dr. Stuart Waugh has uh, created uh, and optimized some wood chip boxes as polishing units. Um, so the idea being that we can hook up our wood chip boxes that we're already using, same sort of thing we're using for our uh, whole NRB um, and hook up this wood chip box to take that influent uh, or effluent from another approved system uh, and treat it and have that nitrogen be as low as possible. Um, and, and again, if you see the number I'm, I'm putting here, less than three milligrams per liter, uh, that's an ambitious number. But again, this is a second treatment and it's the exact kind of treatment we need in areas where we've got very high levels of nitrogen uh, and or very sensitive regions that is near a public wellhead and or uh, near a, coast, a sensitive coastal ecosystem. So Dr. Waz done experiments testing different types of uh, wood chips, different size wood chip boxes. And through these experiments, he's settled on a design that uh, maximizes the performance while minimizing the amount of residence time needed uh, for these systems. And we've installed one of these. So I'm gonna show some exciting results. We've installed one of these on a Fuji Clean system. So one of the systems approved by Suffolk County. And, uh, and remember, to be approved, the average level of nitrogen coming out of a system needs to be 19 milligrams per liter. Uh, and that's average over many systems and of course all the sampling. But the systems don't always perform to that level. And there can be seasonal variability. Um, in our own experience, we've even seen for our NRBs, we, you know, we've got great mean levels, but we have some systems that have very low effluent and others that are above average. And so this Fuji Clean system uh, is uh, performing above average for a Fuji Clean with uh, about 30 milligrams per liter of nitrogen effluent, but it's mainly nitrate, which is exactly what we need for a wood chip box. So we install the wood chip box at this home in Wainscott. And in doing so, we're getting effluent that's two milligrams per liter. Um, and again, that's uh, getting us even far beyond our own goal of 10 milligrams per liter uh, but it demonstrates that we can work with any commercially available IA system and get them to fit our 10, 20, 30 goal. Uh, and that is, or at least the 10 part, getting it down below 10 milligrams per liter. We've also done wood chip box installations at some non-residential locations. So for example, in East Hampton at the Springs Elementary School, they upgraded their systems with a series of IA systems, uh, but they had the space to have the effluent from those IA systems to flow to a series of wood chip boxes, um, which uh, will polish, will remove the, rem the uh, remaining nitrate and get it again, as low as possible. Now, another type of final deposition and potential um, uh, polishing unit might be a drain field. Uh, and uh, here's a sort of a conventional drain field, the type that often is installed in uh, Suffolk County. Um, what we've discovered is that a regular drain field actually doesn't really remove that much nitrogen. In the data we've collected, we cannot affirm that a conventional drain field uh, after an IA system removes any more nitrogen uh, than if it were to just go to a uh, leaching ring. But again, Dr. Stuart Waugh has advanced the idea of a denitrifying drain field. Um, and the schematic shown here would be, again, wastewater going to any kind 
of IA system, be it Hydro Action, Fuji Clean, or Renko. Um, and that, again, is going to be receiving high levels of nitrogen. And in an ideal world, it's what's leaving it is less than or around 19 milligrams per liter of nitrate. And, um, and then from there, going into what we call a denitrifying drain feed. And just like the wood chip boxes, the idea being that the effluent comes out the other end at less than uh, five milligrams per liter. Um, and in the vertical, what this would look like would be a layer of uh, sand mixed with our wood chips. Um, and ha again, having that effluent get down as low as possible and below five milligrams per liter. But just stepping back for a moment from all of these wastewater systems, and I've given you a lot of nitrogen numbers, um, but the question is, you know, how do we know these numbers? How confident are we, are we in them? Um, you know, how do we know how well an on-site septic system is performing and how variable is that performance and what drives that variance? And to date, what well, the answers for that have come from uh, uh, collecting samples in person. One person being there, grabbing a sample, taking it back to the lab, measuring it. I can tell you it's very labor intensive. We spend a lot of time doing that. Um, so the question then is, what if we had an autonomous monitoring device? that could measure different types of nitrogen wastewater and just give us the answers while we sat at our desk. Um, well, this is something the EPA was very, very interested in and through collaboration with the Nature Conservancy set up a national challenge for uh, asking anyone in the country, can you create an autonomous monitoring device that can measure nitrate and ammonium, two types of nitrogen that you find in wastewater um, and do it for less than $1,500? And there are many participants uh, and entrance to this competition. And it turns out one of our own scientists at the Center for Clean Water Technology won this national competition. Uh, Dr. Ching Zhu, uh, who's shown here and his nitrogen sensor, um, outperformed all of the other entrants to this uh, competition and is advanced through actually the final stages of the competition. Uh, there was a uh, 48 hour challenge, a one week challenge, a one month challenge and a six month challenge um, and passed the test on all of them. And for those of you who might be interested in some of the details, you can see here during the one month test, the type of percent recoveries that are gotten with this, um, obtained with this instrument, uh, the standard deviation, the range of measurements, the linearity of the measurements, uh, all very impressive. Um, the last test, the six month test, was actually a certification by the International Organization of Standardization. Uh, so an ISO 14034 ETV certification, uh, which we've obtained because again, even during six months of testing, this system uh, cleared the bar when it came to both accuracy and precision. Uh, and that was with only looking at the device, being able to uh, monitor and maintain the device only once during that six month period. So we're very excited about this and uh, this technology and its potential moving forward. Uh, and we're going, we continue to um, revise and refine the technology. And we're hoping by this summer and fall to start putting these into actual uh, septic systems. I should say this testing here was at the uh, Massachusetts um, uh, septic uh, wastewater facility for testing. Um, so it was getting wastewater that would have gone to a sewage treatment plant, but was not in an IA system. So that's our next stop in the journey for this sensor is to install it within actual septic systems and to make the data telemetered so that we're receiving the data in real time uh, to a singular website um, and seeing its performance. Um, and again, being able to know how systems are, the performance of systems are changing uh, over time will give us a lot of information with regards to how these individual IA systems are performing. Uh, and then thereafter, there is uh, interest in Suffolk County and the Nature Conservancy for purchasing 200 of these units for installs. Uh, and we've also had inquiries from uh, people in Massachusetts as well as on Eastern Long Island about installing these on systems there, because this gives you the assurance that the system you've installed is achieving the effluent that it's said that it will. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, otherwise it's said it and forget it and hope for the best. Um, this 
instrument will allow us to set it and know what the effluent is uh, and frankly adjust as needed um, and make sure that when there is that big investment, because these are big investments, that they're uh, delivering what is promised. And we're working in parallel uh, to both identify potential commercial partners, uh, manufacturing partners, and considering the uh, creation of a startup company uh, to make this a viable venture uh, to promote jobs um, and the economy here in Long Island. Okay, so beyond wastewater itself, I do wanna move on and talk about other things that we're doing to address uh, nitrogen contamination, and that's permanent reactive barriers. Um, and you can see how these are supposed to operate. The idea is to intercept groundwater uh, before it enters surface waters uh, or before it uh, approaches a wellhead. Because the fact of the matter is, despite the fact that we're, we've got so many people now working uh, to upgrade these septic systems, uh, and Suffolk County has, for example, their subwatersheds plan, it's a very clear laid out plan for the next 30 years to upgrade over 200,000 septic systems across Long Island. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's gonna, like I said, 30 years, it will take decades to um, make all of these upgrades and frankly, it will also take decades for the legacy nitrogen in groundwater to flush out of the aquifer. And so these PRBs are a perfect instrument uh, to be uh, address nitrogen contamination right now while we address the watershed issues uh, and to address the legacy nitrogen before it's entering a coastal ecosystem or a wellhead. One great opportunity that we and others have identified for installing permanent reactive barriers are at bulkheads. Uh, you can see here, bulkheads are often over time will degrade and will need to be upgraded from the old decaying type uh, made of wood to perhaps ones that are made of um, some sort of plastic product that will have a longer longevity. But when you're doing that, uh, you need to have the excavation equipment in there anyway. Great opportunity to put in potentially a PRB. And we've collaborated with Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, to test this idea. Uh, so over uh, in Ch along uh, in Hampton Bays in Chindicock Bay, uh, a PRB test cell was installed. Um, you can see the image of it here, right along a bulkhead. And, um, and it works spectacularly. I'm not gonna go over the details, but over several years, uh, continually removed about 90% of the nitrate before it discharged into Chindicock Bay. And in exciting news, last summer, again, in collaboration with Cornell and with support from the Town of Southampton's Community Preservation Fund, um, a 100-foot permeable active barrier was installed along Shinnecock Bay uh, to treat nitrate-contaminated groundwater before it enters the bay. Um, and to our knowledge, this is either the biggest or one of the biggest PRBs ever installed in New York State. But when it comes to PRBs, uh, there's you know, certainly, again, a great opportunity for tr treating legacy contamination. Um, but they can be complex and expensive. You see here, to install some of these things, you actually need to put them into the groundwater. So you've got to be able to bring in, for example, an excavator that can dig down, not just down to where the groundwater is, but then you need to go below the groundwater and to get the groundwater out. So you can put the, for example, wood chips in that permanent reactive barrier to remove the nitrate. Uh, and then beyond that, in other places, we've discovered they're not always going to work because maybe the nitrogen levels aren't, in a particular area, as low as you think. Or it's the wrong kind of nitrogen. Or the groundwater flow might not be high enough, or the oxygen levels might not be high enough. Now, we're looking on solutions for all of these factors, but when it comes to these final two factors, uh, Dr. Stuart Watts come up with a couple, uh, a specific approach uh, that we're excited to test out and we'll be testing out uh, in the coming year. And that's something that he calls the carbon array. Uh, and the idea of the carbon array is essentially to install, instead of a long barrier, a system, a series of um, holes, only less than three inches wide, that can go deep into the groundwater uh, and to fill those holes with wood chips. Uh, and the idea being that, firstly, this is very inexpensive compared to uh, what is needed for a PRB. Uh, because you can install these individual uh, um, zones for denitrification uh, with something known as a geoprobe. I'm not sure what that looks like momentarily, uh, but it works very quickly. 
uh, and it's uh, smaller and simpler, and it's certainly much less expensive. And so each of these uh, holes, you, you can think of it as a reactive rod filled with wood chips. Uh, as it denitrifies the groundwater and the nitrate goes to nitrogen gas, it's actually going to bring more nitrate in via diffusion. Um, and then in addition, they're, because they're filled with wood chips, the carbon that's in there will diffuse outward uh, and create a larger zone of denitrification, ideally the whole zone surrounding uh, the entire array. And, uh, and through lab experiments at the WERF and other places, we've been able to optimize the exact size and configuration of these. So here's an install that we did. And so you can see here, this is, uh, this is the geoprobe. Uh, that's able to put in, uh, can be put in for small wells, or in our case specifically put in to fill with our, um, our wood chip sources uh, to promote the denitrification. You can see just filling these um, vessels with the wood chips and putting them back into each site. Um, and this was installed just last month. Um, so we've got the different uh, arrays in there, and we've got a plan for sampling around them to robustly understand the dynamics of nitrogen and also carbon and how these can work to be another solution for addressing legacy nitrogen contamination before we have discharge into coastal ecosystems. We're going to now transition into drinking water uh, and specifically just mention that shortly after the center was founded to address wastewater, uh, we were then asked to address drinking water concerns uh, on Long Island with the biggest concern and the issue we addressed first being 1,4-dioxane. 1,4-dioxane uh, is an industrial solvent. Um, and there are, again, I've already mentioned because of prior industrial activities in Long Island, some of the highest levels of 1,4-dioxane are actually the highest level ever documented in the United States is found uh, on Long Island. Uh, but in, in addition, it's recently become, um, we've become aware that it's also and many household products, some of them shown here, uh, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, did some testing of household products. And we're looking at here's what they call the dirty dozen that had the highest levels of 1,4-dioxane. Uh, and I've already mentioned that this is uh, a probable carcinogen according to the EPA and very difficult to remove. And the contamination is widespread on Long Island. So map here from Suffolk County Water Authority showing wellheads that have levels of 1,4-dioxane that are at a half of PPB uh, and above a half of PPB and therefore will need treatment um, to meet the new state standard of one PPB. And you can see there are literally dozens, dozens of wellheads here uh, where we're gonna need some sort of technology and standard technology does not work for 1,4-dioxane. You can't filter it out. You can't use granulated active carbon. You can't use air stripping. Uh, the only thing we do know you can work is advanced oxidation processes. And so Dr. Arjun Van Katesen, the Associate Director for Drinking Water Studies for the Center for Clean Water Technology, led the charge whereby we collaborated with multiple water purveyors uh, in Nassau County and in Suffolk County to try different technologies to identify those that would be optimal the type of advanced oxidation process that would be optimal for removing 1,4-dioxane. And you can see what's in, in all cases, it involves a UV source uh, coupled with an oxidant, um, be it hydrogen peroxide, titanium, uh, chlorine-based product, or ozone. Uh, and the question is, which of these is going to perform best? Which is going to be the least expensive? And also, as importantly, which is not going to create more problems? And we've looked very carefully, you can see measuring not just the removal of 1,4-dioxane, but we don't want to create uh, another problem while solving one problem. We don't want pollution swapping going on. Uh, and therefore, we've tested for all sorts of byproducts. Um, and in the end, we did identify the approaches, or I should say Dr. Van Kintasen identified the approaches along with Dr. Uh, Cheng Shuan Li, the approaches that were optimal for removing 1,4-dioxane. Uh, and so that is, you can see the different, um, what this is shown here is the lower the value here, the better the performance, uh, the better removal you're getting with the amount of energy being put out. Um, and what we identified is all the systems that used hydrogen peroxide uh, or used the ozone, all were the best performers and outperformed titanium uh, and the chlorine-based products as well, which is great. And this allows us now to, uh, 
inform Suffolk County Water Authority and other water uh, purveyors on exactly which technologies they should and probably should not choose in order to um, be optimal for removing 1,4-dioxane and not containing, uh, creating other contaminants. Beyond 1,4-dioxane, uh, another contaminant group that we're highly focused on are PFAS. Um, and so these are compounds with a carbon fluorine bond, one of the strongest bonds known um, and has been in widespread use in firefighting foams is one of the strongest sources there, uh, but also in many household products, Teflon coating of pans, uh, coating of carpets, of food um, containers. Uh, and that's because all of these things resist water and grease. So they're great uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, they've come up with the moniker forever chemicals because we cannot remove these. They are so resistant to degradation uh, they are found everywhere. And uh, the example that is often used that uh, you can test a polar bear in the Arctic that has done nothing but living um, up in the Arctic Circle, and it's going to have PFAS in its blood. And that's how widespread this contamination is. And it's of serious concern because of, it's been implicated in many, many, many um, uh, human health uh, syndromes and concerns uh, to the point where even babies are being born with uh, elevated levels of PFAS in their blood because they're getting it uh, from their mothers. Um, and it's an issue here on Long Island. Again, here are wellheads that are going to need solutions for removing PFAS because the new state reg uh, regulations um, are now been lowered. And so now these are all wellheads that have levels that are above what, uh, and this is just Suffolk County Water Authority. There are many other water purveyors that are not even uh, on this map. Um, and they're going to need technologies to remove this from uh, water supplies. In the Center for Clean Water Technology, we've actually established a laboratory uh, that can make measurements of PFAS and multiple types of PFAS compounds. Uh, this is via funding from the state. Uh, we are now an, an environmental laboratory. We went through the environmental laboratory accreditation process and we have our ELAB certification from the New York State Department of Health and we're working with Suffolk County for monitoring PFAS across Suffolk County. Um, with that certification we're getting 18 different analytes uh, and with a second method we're using we're actually getting now 30 different types of PFAS compounds uh, because right now there are regulations only in New York State for PFAS and PFOA, uh, two specific types of PFAS compounds. Um, but literally, there are thousands of those compounds out there. So beyond making measurements, we're also engaged in research on PFAS, specifically looking at the other types of compounds. So there are literally now thousands of PFAS compounds. There's been a lot of focus on PFAS um, and uh, PFOA, but you know, we, we are looking beyond that to understand the prevalence of shorter chain PFAS compounds and also what we call Gen X replacement compounds. Um, and unfortunate news, P, well, in good news, PFO and PFAS have been banned. Uh, but in unfortunate news, uh, what has happened has been an uh, issue of pollution swapping and that there's been new compounds made uh, to replace those uh, that are now also prevalent. And uh, we don't know a lot about those. Uh, but we're also gonna be testing different technologies uh, working on building pilot scale systems uh, to see how they work um, and how they work on their own and together with, with other treatments, uh, and also identify things that can actually destroy these compounds. Remember, these are forever compounds. If you remove them from a water supply, they're still there. And so maybe they're in the, for example, granulate active carbon, and then you've got, a, you've got another source of contamination that you've got to get rid of. So we're looking at methods that will no longer make them forever and that we might destroy them. And so uh, one method we're looking at is electron beam technology that uh, puts excited electrons into aqueous phase to look at they can destroy PFAS. And, and in exciting news, uh, one of our graduate students, uh, Kaushik, has just published a paper uh, identifying how an electron beam technology can be used to destroy both PFOA and PFAS. Um, by adjusting the pH of the water and then applying this electron beam. 
And beyond that, uh, well, first thing is similar to what sh showed before. This is one of the most efficient processes for removing uh, uh, PFAS compounds. Um, but we're also looking to other approaches as well. For example, electrochemical oxidation. We have a collaboration with um, a company known as a Clarity that has some electrochemical oxidation uh, products, and we're using that to test the destruction of PFO and PFAS. Uh, and it looks actually like we, we're getting towards optimizing that for removing these compounds. The last thing I just want to mention uh, before we wrap up is one last thing that we've done as a center during the last year, and that was responding to the global uh, pandemic of COVID-19 that struck, um, struck everyone in 2020. And specifically, as it struck, uh, what we became to realize as scientists is that the virus itself, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, was ending up uh, that when people contract the virus, they pass the virus um, uh, through their feces and therefore the virus is detectable within wastewater. And importantly, the detection of the virus in wastewater in early studies seemed to be in advance of symptoms. And remember, the big problem with COVID-19 was the idea that people were infected, were passing the virus on to other people, and were showing absolutely no symptoms. And so that sort of asymptomatic transmission was really at the root of the problems. And so the nice thing about the approach of looking for the virus within wastewater, specifically from a sewage treatment plant, is that when you collect that wastewater, you're looking at both the people who are sick and passing the virus, but also the people who are asymptomatic. And remember that asymptomatic can be on two levels. It can be some people, it can be the people who have the virus and will soon be symptomatic, but also can be the people who contract the virus and they never know they have it. Um, and so the idea is to start looking at this in wastewater and seeing, can we, um, find that virus in the wastewater, and if so, can it be useful? And so we, we began almost a year ago where we started doing work in um, collecting wastewater from the Riverhead sewage treatment plant. And here's our very first data set where we showed that during the peak of the pandemic, this is actually data from 2020, showing that we did indeed see high levels, uh, but that over time, those levels uh, dropped down and were near undetectable uh, come spring. In the fall, we transitioned to doing some work at Stony Brook University, uh, and this proved to be very, very useful. Um, and what you can see here is a time course through the fall of looking at the virus. Now, you may recall that um, you know, we had a lull here on Long Island when it came to the virus and specifically didn't see much going on in the summer and e even in the early fall. Uh, but in looking for the virus, you can see come November, we saw levels start to tick up significantly uh, and so some very high caseloads. Um, turns out the university made the right call. For those of you who don't know or weren't familiar with the idea, they sent the students home uh, for Thanksgiving break. And so the levels then dropped off. There were still a few people left in the dorms, but not only did they, they made the exact right call, not even knowing that the virus was going to be at high levels. Uh, well, maybe they had the inkling that it would. And so that was the right call. Uh, there were some people left in the dorms that are after it, but you continue to see low levels. Uh, but this was actually predictive in that the levels we found uh, in the wastewater stream uh, came just in advance of increase in levels on campus. And then our biggest effort here has been uh, monitoring the Bergen Point sewage treatment plant uh, that's in the western part of Suffolk County. It captures what's known as the Southwest Sewer District. Even though 70% of Suffolk County is unsewered, the majority of the people who are sewered or within this uh, sewer district, on the Southwest Sewer District, hundred serving hundreds of thousands of people. And so here's a data set from that plant uh, that extends all the way, it's a one year data set that we now have, uh, extends back to June of 2020. Uh, we had semi, uh, not less frequent sampling uh, through the year 2020, but what the data show, we did a lot of sampling early on and we saw it did see a peak uh, during the first wave of coronavirus here uh, in New York and on Long Island, low levels through the summer and fall, uh, and actually and then an uptick 
we started seeing in, uh, in early November and then continued high levels through the holiday season um, and a, sort of a persistence through the spring. And only now is starting to drop down. And in happy news, we actually got our first no detect uh, on one of our samples in the last, uh, in fact, the last two weeks of four samples collected, uh, two, I believe, one in each week had no detection. And so we're hopeful that that pattern continues. Um, but when we look at the level of the virus in the wastewater, and we look at caseloads in Suffolk County, uh, the one interesting thing is that the peak that we see, so you can see we're sort of a baseline through the summer and fall, we ended up seeing a peak that was, I mean, it's hard to say based on the, the, the amount of sampling, but that could have been predictive of what was coming in the future. Um, and so this may be important going forward. You know, thankfully and hopefully, we're going to get through the end of this pandemic. But this, uh, th this study has shown that this approach can be useful for tracking disease and pandemics within uh, sewer communities. At the end of the scientific content, again, just reminding you that this is the, uh, we've done one year of these seminars. We're going to take a break for the months of July and August, give everybody a chance to uh, enjoy their summer, but we will be back in the fall. So please do join us uh, on the first Monday of each month to hear more about what we're up to, uh, expanding our presentations to people. For example, the next one will be do by Dr. Jamie Melliker uh, from the medical school. And so you'll get to hear from our different collaborators as well. You can follow our what we're doing with regards to our science. Uh, we put all of our new scientific articles online, publicly and free, available to the public. Um, and so, and we're very proud of the fact that each year we publish more and more papers in international peer-reviewed journals, five of those so far this year. And our goal is to get to 10 by the end of the year. We're quite confident we'll get there. And you can also follow us on our Twitter account. So just Wrapping up the things that we've covered, I've showed you that NRBs remove more nitrogen and dangerous organic comp, uh, contaminants than any other advanced septic system and will be available for widespread installation in 2022. Our flex street system continues to generate less than 10 milligrams per liter as well and will be smaller and hopefully less expensive than our first generation systems. Um, we've shown you our wood chip polishing units can get effluent down even below two milligrams per liter. And these can be installed with any other uh, IA system on Suffolk County, helping the county get the cleanest groundwater possible. Our nitrogen sensor is more accurate, precise, and less expensive than any comparable sensor on the market. And so this can be a great commercial opportunity going forward. Our carbon arrays hold great promise to be the, the next generation of PRBs or to be the other uh, yet another tool in the toolbox for addressing legacy nitrogen contamination. Showed you that our pilot installations of AOP and different drinking water uh, purveyors have demonstrated the precise way that those purveyors can go about to efficiently remove 1,4-dioxane from our drinking water while not creating additional contaminant problems from other byproducts. We've gained certification for measuring PFAS and PFOA uh, and actually can measure more than 30 of these compounds. Um, and we've discovered that electrochemical techniques can hold the problems for permanently destroying these forever compounds. Uh, so maybe making them not forever. Um, and then finally, we showed you how wastewater epidemiology uh, may be a great method for tracing the pandemic in our communities going forward. So with that, I'd like to support, uh, acknowledge the support from both the DEC and the DOH here in New York, Bloomberg Foundation, Towns of East Hampton, South Hampton, Department of Energy, uh, the Roush Foundation and National Philanthropic Trust. And I thank you all kindly for your attention. And if anyone has any questions, I would very happily address them now. To start with, I have a comment from Christina Heineman from EPA. She gave an important clarification, and that is that uh, our ISO, we're getting, uh, uh, for our nitrogen sensor, we're getting ISO verification, it's not certification, and that performance 
Verification, however, will culminate in a public verification statement on the Vera Global website. So thank you for that, Christina, and thank you for your interest and continued support from the US EPA. Any questions, if anyone has them, they can put them in the chat or they can unmute and go ahead and ask them. And if not, that's uh, perfectly fine as well. We're over time, I guess, by a couple minutes, so. Okay. Well, with that, then hearing no <laughs> inquiries, we can close the seminar. I thank everyone for attending and hope that we'll get everybody back uh, come fall to continue to be updated by the progress of the center. So thank you kindly for your attention. Stay in touch and uh, have a great summer. Best to you all.